Hi, and welcome back to the 24th annual George Mason Law Review Antitrust Symposium. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser kick off us, us off this morning uh, with a keynote. And now we are on to our first panel of the symposium. And I think we've uh, put a great one uh, together to talk about uh, priorities in the new administration uh, for antitrust. It is certainly uh, one of the most interesting times in the antitrust landscape, certainly uh, during my, my lifetime. We've got uh, everything up for grabs, substantive legal standards, uh, administrative procedures, the number of agencies that we have uh, doing the enforcing, uh, maybe a creation of a new antitrust competition related position uh, in the White House, significant proposals coming out of uh, the House, Senate, academia, just about everywhere. Um, and the court's getting in on the action too. A couple of antitrust cases uh, in front of the Supreme Court um, and, and maybe more coming in uh, the years to come. Uh, with all of that change uh, comes uh, an incoming new administration uh, with new priorities and new viewpoints and a new lens through which to uh, evaluate some of the important challenges uh, facing antitrust, uh, excuse me, facing modern antitrust. And we have got uh, a fantastic set of panelists uh, put together to address these issues. Uh, our panelists are uh, Maureen Olhausen. Uh, Maureen chairs the antitrust group at Baker Botts and where she focuses on competition, privacy and regulatory issues. She served as acting FTC chairman from January 2017 to May 2018, and as a commissioner uh, starting in uh, 2012. Uh, Maureen has published uh, dozens and dozens of articles on antitrust privacy regulation uh, in the FTC, and is a, a proud Scalia alum, uh, and we are, we are thrilled to have her uh, with us. Bill Baer is visiting fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Bill served at both the FTC and the DOJ as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division of the DOJ from 2013 to 16, as a Director of the Bureau of Competition at the FTC from 1995 to 1995, uh, where Bill, this is not in his bio, but was my boss when I was an intern uh, at, at the FTC. Um, and as well as, uh, as an attorney advisor at the FTC to the chairman and assistant G general counsel for legislation and congressional relations. Uh, Bill was also the associate attorney general, uh, the third highest ranking office in the DOJ, where he saw antitrust, uh, oversaw antitrust civil, civil rights divisions and tax. Um, and last but not least uh, is Bill Kovacic. Uh, Bill's global competition professor of law and policy professor of law and director of the Competition Law Center at George Washington uh, before joining the law school uh, in 1999. Uh, he also has roots at the George Mason University School of Law as it was known uh, back then. Uh, from January 2006 to 2011, he was a member of the Federal Trade Commission and chaired the agency from 2008 and 2009. Uh, this is a panel, honestly, if you are a member of the antitrust community that needs no introduction, but I gave you one anyway. Uh, let's save the rest of the time uh, to hear from the panelists. We'll, uh, we'll have sort of opening perspectives from each and then uh, try to get a little bit of a dialogue and conversation uh, started. I know audience, you'll be able to um, submit questions. I'll be getting those and, and try to ask those towards the end of the, uh, the time period as well. So without further ado, welcome to each of you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. It is, uh, and on a personal note, great to see each of you, uh, even if through a screen. And uh, why don't we uh, start with Bill Baer to get us uh, kicked off. Bill? <laughs> Thank you, Josh, and it's great to be part of this program. Great to be on a panel with uh, with you and with Bill and Maureen. Um, two preliminary notes. One is uh, if you do want me to update my bio to include the fact that I supervised you when you were an intern, I'll do it, but you may not want that uh, out in the public domain any more than it already is. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the second is if, if 
this is the balanced panel, and I'm representing the left progressive part of uh, antitrust competition policy. I think there's still a lot of room to my left that uh, can and has been filled by a lot of other people. But look, let me, um, uh, you know, we're at this point in an administration changeover. And actually, I counted last time. Um, I've actually been involved either on the periphery or actively involved in six different transitions from one party to the other as a result of the presidential election outcome, which I probably shouldn't do because it, it tells you a little bit about how old I, uh, I am. But we're at that early stage where a lot of decisions haven't been, been made. We don't know who the people are who are going to be in most of these positions, save for who's going to be uh, at least acting chair uh, at, the, uh, at the FTC. And what happens is, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So the speculation machine gets, nut, you know, gets going, names get floated. Uh, some names are floated so they can be attacked and shot down. Uh, you know, the press picks it up as informed opinion and, and very often it's not. So we are at that early stage where we don't really know who the people are involved, uh, but also because in my experience, personnel really does significantly drive policy. It is challenging to predict where the FTC, where DOJ antitrust will go and how they will, will interrelate with, another, with one another. So what I thought I'd do in the opening few minutes is talk about uh, what I'd recommend to people if anyone ever asked my advice about how you go out through that first six months. Um, and uh, my first point is that uh, it's so important to focus internally. It is so tempting to go external and, and because you'll be barraged with speaking engagements, but you need to build your internal team. You need to begin uh, uh, figuring out what important decisions absolutely have to be made in the first week, month, six months. But you also need to be developing a long-term agenda, developing priorities, building trust between the career staff and the political uh, appointees. You know, the career people need to know that how you plan to captain the ship, what your battle plan is. Um, uh, you know, I, I think all of us would agree that the career professionals at both agencies want to follow uh, uh, the leader, uh, but they need to know in which direction. And so focusing on developing priorities, communicating priorities, building trust takes an enormous amount of time. And doing that uh, placing a um, higher priority on that than on exter external communication is the right way to go. One of the reasons I say that is what can you say externally in the first 30, 60, 90 days? There's a tendency, I think, to talk boldly about what you are going to do. And at that early stage in a changeover, you may not be able to deliver on the things you would like to do. You may not have the cases in front of you that allow you to test this legal principle or to articulate a new factual uh, theory. So you end up generating external expectations in the antitrust silo, the academicians, the, the lawyers, the economists who, who follow this day to day, that you just don't know whether you're going to be able to to me. So take a deep breath, give yourself time, work on building those, uh, those internal relationships. Now, you know, the new leadership, new leadership at both agencies clearly going to confront some challenges. Some of them are shared, uh, you know, budget issues uh, are significant for both the FTC and the antitrust division, maybe a uh, uh, bigger at the FTC, but they are very, very significant. And with high expectations and not a lot of funding, uh, you're in a, in a difficult place. 
both each agency has a major, major monopolization case that's at the front end that is going to suck up resources like uh, you wouldn't believe. But so they share that in common. They also share the need, the absolute compelling need to do a better job of coordinating with each other. It's not just clearance, which was a disaster these last uh, four, four years, but coordinating on, on, on guidance, coordinating on how they're gonna approach the relationship between uh, standard essential patent holders and application of the antitrust laws. Both, I think, need to focus on, uh, on state AG cooperation and coordination. Those two cases, Facebook at the FTC, Google at DOJ, there already is some of that going on, and it's a great vehicle to build trust. Some would say rebuild build trust, but there also needs to be cooperation on appellate matters, matters up at the Supreme Court, matters where cert is or is going to be sought, um, talking through what in the ABA transition report, which came out, what, last week, uh, what things are worth considering and, and what not, and I can go into more on that uh, a little bit later. Over at the Justice Department, you know, where I most recently worked, morale is a mess. I have never seen anything like it. What is it? They were rated last year 404th of about 415 uh, uh, components of, uh, uh, of agency components. Um, morale is bad. I know that from talking to people and talking to people who talk to people. Um, there is related to that low morale, a perception that over the course of the last years that the regular order was abandoned in favor of lots of private meetings, privileged access, and not non-antitrust considerations uh, infecting some decision making. And I'm not just talking about the public whistleblower allegations about the 11 or 12, whatever it was, cannabis merger investigations or the, uh, the investigation into the auto manufacturers dealing with the California Air Resources Board. But the stories that I've heard from staff and from people who deal with staff really suggest this was a serious and pervasive problem. There, were n there was not good communication from the political leadership of the antitrust division to the, to the career staff. Uh, there are stories out there of, of staff calling counsel for parties, asking if they know, knew whether a meeting occurred between political figures in the antitrust division and, and corporate executives, and if so, what the outcome was. Uh, that's how bad the communication was and how concerned career people were uh, at, the, uh, at the Justice Department. Now, we've got a career, extraordinarily talented acting Assistant Attorney General Richard Powers. He's already talked publicly about that need, desire, and his commitment to getting back to, uh, uh, to regular order. And that is a that's a very important thing. At the FTC, the, the challenges are obvious. You know, the first three challenges are budget, budget, and budget. And then it's, then it's 13B, right? And the very uh, serious looming risk that consumer redress and disgorgement uh, uh, under 13B will be taken away by a Supreme Court decision. In addition, I think at, at the FTC, there needs to be serious consideration given to organizational structure at the uh, at the bureau level, whether they the current structure appropriately takes into account uh, technology issues, technology challenges, uh, privacy concerns, whether interbureau coordination is what it needs to be. In addition, I think a hard look at the priorities of the Bureau of Economics is is in order, you know, the, uh, at the Justice Department, uh, you know, there is independent research, which is encouraged and, uh, and, and writing, uh, but uh, it is required to be mission oriented to support the competition or consumer protection mission in the case of the FTC. At the Bureau of Economics, there's considerable ability to do research that's 
outside the actual day-to-day -day mission. And, and I'm not sure that is a priority that with budget constraints uh, and the wealth of data through 6 b studies that has been obtained by the FTC and is the FTC is in the process of, of obtaining, that BE is, uh, is serving the function it ought to be serving. So those are some out there thoughts that, you know, um, people will or will not listen to, but it's my sense of, of where things ought to go in the first six months with regard to federal antitrust enforcement. Thanks, Bill. That's a, that's a great start. And uh, let me turn to Maureen. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Josh. Happy to be here and on the panel with Bill and Bill, I'm um, really uh, excited to talk about these important topics. So let me just start off saying I agree with much of what Bill Baer said, particularly on the resource issue, budgetary um, mind, <laughs> you know, the ability, the bandwidth issue, you know, of what what an, an agency can take on uh, successfully. And you know, there's this temptation to go out there and make a big splash and say. You know, we're gonna we're gonna change everything. We're gonna do everything. We're going to challenge everything. Um, but but the problem is, you 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 raise those expectations, and then do you have the resources to do to do all those things and to see them through to the end? And that was one of the things that I always tried to pay attention to, uh, even when I was the head of the office of policy planning. I said, well, if we're going to say we're going to do something, let's work backwards. Let's figure out all the things that have to go into that and when we want it out and then work backwards from there to make sure we're working to a plan because there, I think there really is this temptation to make a big splash and say we're, we're doing so many things and then not be able to see, to see them all the way through. Um, and I do think expectations have already been raised quite a bit. Uh, with the idea that you know more mergers are going to be challenged, or that non-reportable mergers now that might be um, typically granted early termination are going to get a harder look, um, that the agency is going to be doing at the FTC more things. DOJ, it's harder to say because right now you know, we've got um, a career staffer kind of kind of running things, and you know Gene Kimmelman there, and certainly you no. Know, no slight to them, but I think, you know, <clears throat> acting uh, Chairman Slaughter has been a little more forthright about what some, some of her goals are. Capabilities are really, really key. Bill already mentioned both agencies have big resource intensive cases already being, already being litigated. Um, uh, one of the challenges is if you throw all your resources at the first few things that walk in the door, is the cupboard bare when the next set of mergers or conduct or some com something comes through? Um, I, I know that there is, you know, a sense of well, if we if we take on a lot and, and you know the agencies aren't able to do it, maybe that will spur Congress to give them more resources and to give them more authority. But I also think that there's some risks to what I would call the if you play hearts, the shoot the moon approach, which is <laughs> if you lose enough thing, it's things that transmutes into a winning a winning hand. Um, Congress has a lot on its plate, right? Like we, we you all, all of us live in the antitrust bubble, and we like that's our thing, and we're you know it's like wow, it's in the news, it's this and that. But you know, I don't think the average consumer is calling up their member of Congress saying antitrust enforcement. You know, they're they're saying you know healthcare pandemic. My kids aren't in school. I uh, don't, you know, I, I need money. I, you know, all, all those kinds of things. So, so while I think there is obviously the most interest that I've seen in my career in doing things differently in antitrust, we're still a long way from, from that actually being translated into more resources for the agencies and, you know, a different, um, a different uh, standard of antitrust uh, law. So, um, so, but what are some of the things that, that, that can be done, right? So um, I think one of the things that um, acting uh, Chairwoman Slaughter has mentioned is, you know, some of her interest on, um, you know, pandemic, right? Addressing pandemic issues. The FTC has a really good record and I think a lot of expertise in healthcare issues and, you know, continued enforcement in healthcare. I think we saw some of the 
you know, challenges that can result from um, undue concentration in, you know, in hospitals, something the agency on a bipartisan basis has spent many years and the DOJ as well trying to, um, trying to, to challenge. Um, racial equity, she's talked about that. You know, to my mind, one of the ways the FTC could really address that is by continuing to focus on undue occupational licensing and some of the economic liberty work that's been done, right? Getting rid of some of the barriers to people on their first step on the economic ladder. Um, I think one of the other issues is, you know, if you wanna do your big, big merger challenge, you kind of have the right one that walks in the door, right? It's, uh, it it kind of comes to you. It's, it's hard for you to go out and search it out now. You know, theoretically, if uh, there's an interest in doing some sort of, you know, much like the, the Facebook case that's already been brought, some idea of like a, you know, a merger that was, it's consummated or something like that. But, but generally, I think, you know, for the for merger enforcement, it's kind of the new the new crop the new crop of mergers, and and the agency does really you know have have challenge. Both both agencies have have a lot of challenges. I think right now we're still like look we're still all operating remotely, right? So there's workforce issues for that. How is that all going to you know get get managed? When will people be back in the office, and and how how those things will uh, will shake out eventually? Another thing that I want to mention is, you know, the FTC has um, its Consumer Protection Authority. And one of the issues that I think should be a priority is um, trying to get a federal privacy law passed, because I think, you know, there's big support for that. There's interest in that. And it, I hope it might also reduce some of the impulse to try to use antitrust more broadly to address what we might really, I would consider as more of a consumer privacy kinds of issues. So I would hope that would be one of the priorities of, um, of the administration, of Congress, uh, and, uh, and of the FTC to, to address some of, those, some of those kinds of issues. Um, Bill mentioned the ABA transition report. Um, I think that's really helpful um, to, to show what practitioners in the field who you know, really care about antitrust and consumer protection, what they are saying the agency should focus on. I know I uh, took very seriously the ABA transition report from, from four years ago. Um, building the team, building the agenda and the priorities, that's very important. No agency, if there's a feeling of drift at the agency, I think that's that's bad for the staff. It's it's you know bad you know for um, you know getting getting things done. So so you want to have a feeling that, you know, whether you've got, I did everything in three month chunks. Here's here's what I can do in the first three months. If I get another three months, here's what I'll do next. And that that kind of thing. And so for a chairwoman slaughter, um, till she has more certainty about, you know, how the agency will be led, you know, I think, you know, having that kind of not pie in the sky, let's do, a, you know, you know, what, what could I accomplish? You know, given infinite resources and an infinite amount of time, but what what can be done in the next in the next few months reasonably? Um, so I, th I think those are all kind of key factors to to keep in mind as an administration is is getting started. And then you know the other thing is, who knows really what's kind of around the corner? So just be careful not to um, to overcommit because <laughs> because that limits your ability to to react. Uh, to situations that that change, you know, think about, you know, the Bush administration, and uh, you know, very early in there was 9/11, that you know, kind of changed a lot of the agency national priorities. We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> no one's really foresaw that. I think, you know, uh, uh, more than a year and a half ago, that this that would be one of the, you know, the defining uh, uh, effects in the in the next year um, and that the fallout from that continues. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think, you know, just sort of, you know, have reasonable goals and don't overcommit your resources. And, uh, but, but it is important to have short-term short -term goals to pursue, even while things are still shaking out uh, into who will, who will be leading, uh, you know, down the road. Thanks, Maureen. Professor Kovacic.
Thank you, Josh. I'm enormously grateful to the Law Review for putting together the symposium, uh, to you for organizing us, and uh, to Bill and Maureen for the privilege of sharing the platform for the day. I think one of the largest overall challenges for the new administration and its leadership is to respond to what may be the most remarkable development in the intellectual framework of competition law and advocacy in my lifetime, certainly since the first transition I watched in 1980. And that is the emergence of the debate between what I'd call the antitrust traditionalists, uh, including those who do more with what we have now, uh, might do a little bit more with what we have, another group, but are largely the product of experiences uh, in government and in practice uh, from the late 70s onward, and what I would call the transformationalists who want to carry out what uh, Sandeep Van Heesen has called root and branch reconstruction. And this group is astonishing. Uh, the, re the transformationalists have changed the debate and they have put the traditionalists on the back foot They've done it through a stunning output in literature. By my count, in the last uh, 24 months, uh, there have been 20 new books that basically recite the themes of the transformationalist group. Uh, they've carried out a very effective campaign of creating a new community, uh, what uh, academics would call a new epistemological community, but a new community which consists of commentators, journalists, academics, uh, and they have used social media with extraordinary effectiveness to build and reinforce that community. And they have used selective opportunities, such as the appointment of Lena Khan to serve as a crucial advisor to House Subcommittee Chair David Cicilline in putting together a report. Uh, it's the most, if you were just studying a campaign of advocacy uh, and an effort to change the debate I'd study this one because it has been so effective in changing the way we talk about the field. And that confronts the new administration with some very difficult arguments. Uh, if we look at what the root and branch group want, and I'm not saying they will get their whole agenda, but they are changing the discussion and they will get some level of appointee in some place in top leadership, maybe not at the department, but at the FTC, uh, to raise the voice on these issues. Uh, what is the agenda? First, no retreads in the government agencies from 1980 to 2020. And their venom is directed most harshly at the Obama administration. I hate to mention it, you four Obama appointees, uh, and I know that it upsets you, but uh, in, 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 a, in a caustic way, they've said that is disqualifying. And I'm included in that group because of my time in the Bush administration. Uh, uh, but all of us, this group would say, have proven one thing during our time in government service, and that's that we don't know how to do this well. We failed. Uh, and when you look at the blogs, when you look at the posts and Twitter, their insistent command is don't let these people back in to drive the car again, because they've shown they've failed. Uh, another key argument they made is, the only way that you test worthiness is by a complete commitment to a new goals framework. That is, do not speak of consumer welfare, even with a broader definition of what it means, but a full commitment to a notion of citizen welfare that encompasses the interests of workers, of small and medium enterprises, of local community control of business, uh, that looks at the egalitarian language of Alcoa a brown shoe, not apologetically, but with pride, and says that's where Congress meant competition law to go, and that's where we should reset it. An enforcement program that elevates uh, the tempo of activity involving with mergers and dominant companies. An enforcement program that abolishes the advocacy program of the agencies as we have known it, that looks at attacks on licensure as being anti-worker, and indeed, 
when you look at the program of the American Economic Liberties Project, one of the things they say most specifically is we will close down the advocacy program. We will take a far more tolerant view of the role of regulation in providing good social benefits. And yes, we want new regulatory tools. Now, this is the critique, the very hard edge critique of competition law the past 40 years which they portray as a wasteland. How much is this going to affect the new administration? How much will it affect appointees? Uh, beyond changing the debate, uh, here are some thoughts that the new team is going to have to address. First, what is going to be the reformulated goals of the antitrust system? When top leadership go to events such as the OECD meeting that will take place at the end of the year, the ICN, and the spotlight is put on them and they're asked, what are the aims of competition law today in the United States? What are they going to say? It will probably be some expanded view of what consumer welfare means, but how much will leaders be pressed to repudiate the approach that has prevailed in the past 40 years? Will they be told, do you believe in that passage in the House report that said consumer interests, the interests of citizens as consumers are only one dimension of citizenship. Will they be pressed and said, do you believe this? Indeed, one of the litmus tests supplied by the transformationalists is to say, if you do not embrace the House report in all of its dimensions, you are not worthy. To what extent will US leadership be pushed to answer that question and what will the answer be? Will there be a different answer from the FTC, which will have five commissioners? Will one member of the board fully embody this perspective and be a strong voice on the board for this point of view? What will the FTC and DOJ define to be the goals of the antitrust laws? Uh, on the DOJ and FTC, Bill mentioned, what will cooperation look like? What happens to Qualcomm in the months ahead? Uh, immediate acid test of the treatment of SCPs. Will the department say, toss out all of Macon's speeches, going back to the UCLA address, bring back your old binders with the guidance that Renata Hesse and her colleagues at the FTC laid at the table at the time they left, new binders back at the front of the desk, old binders back on the shelves. What will be the approach on Qualcomm and how distinctive will the approach be? How sharp a break will we see? Um, will there be, you know, Bill's, Bill's comment about cooperation between the FTC and DOJ, uh, my count of transitions I've watched, uh, Amir Six as well, and reading back to others, uh, this has been an objective uh, since the beginning of time, at least since 1914. Um, uh, would we ever see a full integration of effort that sat down and said, where should we be trying these cases? Is this really a part three case for the FTC's administrative process? And that's where we ought to be running that case. Uh, will the FTC think through what it wants to do with part three? Strikingly in the Facebook case, it goes to federal district court. Here is an enormously important test of the agency's authority. And in a sense, it's saying, we didn't trust using our own process which is really a core reason for us being in business at all. We're not going to use it. Uh, are there reasons to go to federal district court? Of course, but we didn't use it. Much less to achieve a really fully harmonious cooperation, hub and spoke relationship perhaps with our, our, our state governments. In my time at the Competition and Markets Authority at the United Kingdom, which is no longer a part of the European Union, I looked at despair at the difference between what the United Kingdom does internally and what the European Union did to promote genuine cooperation against the relevant institutions. We are so far behind in achieving that in practice that the curvature of the earth keeps you from seeing where the Europeans are and others ahead of us. Uh, on doctrine, how much of the new transformationalist agenda will come back? Demands to bring Robinson Patman back and put it front and center in the enforcement mechanism. Uh, what about merger enforcement? Are we going to go back and retool the horizontal merger guidelines, which are ridiculed for having bumped up the thresholds? Do we immediately toss out the vertical merger guidelines or do we reformulate them in some way? Say that was a good starting point, we're going to carry ahead. Um, 
what is going to be the nature of guidance that comes out on mergers? Bill and Maureen ben both mentioned the question of authority. It's not just 13B, but are you confident enough in those early 1970s DC circuit decisions dealing with rulemaking that creatively and generously interpreted the complete body of the FTC Act to infer power to do competition rulemaking? How hard do you want to lean on those expressions of authority? Or if you want a more ambitious rulemaking program, do you not have to go back to Congress and ask for it, lest you build a huge structure on quicksand that will collapse if this ever gets back up through the appellate process? And in litigation on capacity, uh, Bill and Maureen both mentioned capacity. I think it's a lot more than just having more bodies. It's how much you pay them. And a crucial issue going ahead, and this takes me back to my life at the FTC from 1979 through 1983, where I watched, in many instances, the collapse of an extraordinarily ambitious program that the FTC had pursued, where a major reason for failure was not simply the emergence of political opposition to specific matters well before Ronald Reagan comes to Washington, but a horrible mismatch between commitments and capabilities, where the FTC simply did not have enough elite teams to run difficult cases and rulemaking proceedings. So as we think about adding more matters, are you going to have the right people, enough teams to do these well? Um, it's why Allison Jones and I have said, we're crazy not to at least put the FTC on the same plateau as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That would be a 20% bump in salaries. And on Bill's point about the Bureau of Economics, one reason that the Bureau of Economics offers these ancillary opportunities to economists is because the place that recruits best in the government is what? It's the Fed. Why? It's a 20% salary boost. If you want to harness the effort of the economists more directly to the drivetrain of what the agency does and get first-rate economists, you have to pay for them. And as long as we simply think in terms of adding more people instead of paying more to get elite teams, I fear we're setting ourselves up for failure. That is, there is a limit to how many really tough cases you can run at once. And if you're not willing to face head on the question of getting elite teams to run them. I think you're just asking for disappointment at a later, at a later point in the process. And last, uh, I just ask, what is our message going to be to the international world about what we do? On the question of goals, is our view going to be all goals are appropriate, all of them? Because that's what goes into building a more egalitarian system, a more representative system. Uh, will the FTC and DOJ, DOJ speak the same language on goals? And should we be somewhat careful about simply how do we address the point, the argument that the last 40 years have been a colossal failure, a calamitous failure? And I assure you that our colleagues overseas follow that debate very closely. And they have accepted that narrative. So new management goes out now and says, it's all different. We've got a better team in place. Why should anyone believe that? That you can correct 40 years of failure, uh, 20, 40 years of failure, 40 years of failure simply by bringing in a new team. Uh, I think that will call for some effort to think in a more reflective way about our history and what I find very sad about our transitions over time is that there is a habit of saying, I'm walking into a leper colony and I'm the great healer and I will fix it. When you look across the whole span of activity, there's often something good to preserve from period to period. Will we do that as part of our larger conversation in the United States? But certainly, how will we persuade the rest of the world that we are worth being taken seriously given this perception of a tremendous policy default. Thanks. Well, I guess we have some things to talk about. Um, Bill, that was great. I, you know, I think our audience gets to see this for free and we should be doing pay-per-view for this. All three of you were, were fantastic. Um, so let me start. Um, 
I've got a couple of things to toss around to get perspectives on each of you. And, you know, if you want to go back to something that anyone else has said and it's not exactly responsive, feel free. This is, you know, we're, we're all friends here. Talk about whatever you want. But let me at least uh, try to get us started on sort of one of uh, Bill's major themes and we'll sort of zoom in on some smaller issues. I want to touch on the international piece for sure and maybe go back to merger specifically a little bit later. But at the 30,000 foot level, this um, tension between, goodness, uh, Bill Kovacic, I wish that I, I thought of this term transformationalist before I wrote the hipster antitrust paper for which I got in a little bit of trouble. Uh, I wish you had too. I you also know? wish that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Um, but I like this framing of, of traditionalist versus transformationalist. And we've got this, uh, what I agree is a really unique tension uh, for the incoming administration in dealing with a highly successful, uh, as, as you say, Bill, a highly successful group that has you know, demanded a seat at the table and is gonna gonna get it one way or or, or another, but one that puts um, a lot of these views in tension. You know, throw out the competition advocacy program, maybe throw out the consumer welfare standard, definitely throw out the occupational licensing stuff. Um, state monopoly is 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 sort of in a different category altogether. Um, what do you do, I think, to color some of the, those challenges when the law is what it is in the Supreme Court? Supreme Court, the consumer welfare standard, you know, Mike Lee put out a statement today saying, you know, anything that changes the consumer welfare standard, you know, sort of express some um, sympathy with the views that conservatives ought to have some, you know, discontent with large tech firms. But consumer welfare standard changes to it or attempts to undermine it are political non-starters, he says. Um, that House report recommends overturning, I think, every single Supreme Court antitrust decision since the consumer welfare standard was adopted and overturn a Law Review article by Frank Easterbrook in 1984. I am jealous. I've never written a Law Review article that anybody wants to overturn. I'm, I'm trying. Um, but you know, these are, um, you know, it's at least a baby in the bathwater on some of this stuff. And I think it puts for a law enforcement agencies, it puts them in a, in a posture that wasn't the environment when any of us were in the leadership of uh, respective uh, agencies. It, it's sort of quite a bit different. It is, uh, we are law enforcement agencies, but the enforcement framework is bogus. So what are you going to do? Uh, and if you subscribe to it, you, you know, are unqualified in, in some way. Um, do you, and this is now do the, 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 the question part, I think for the incoming agencies who purport to be law enforcement agencies and the law is what it is, all the action is taking place um, or more action than normal is taking place on the Hill. Are you as an FTC commissioner or as, in AAG, are you advocating in favor of those changes? Are you spending time in the amicus programs um, with part of that agenda? Um, is it more guidance? How, how do you see, I guess it's a twofold question, sort of as a positive matter, how do you see the agencies grappling with that tension? And I guess as a normative matter, how do you think they should? Uh, I'll just go in the same order. Um, why don't we do Bill Bear and then Maureen and, and, and back to Bill Kovacic. So Bill Bear, how don't, what do you think? <laughs> uh, look, this is teeing up important critical questions. First thing I think is um, it's, these aren't necessarily binary choices, even though they often are presented that way. There's a whole lot more nuance here um, on the progressive left in terms of what people would do. And, and, uh, uh, to suggest that everybody who thinks current enforcement has some deficiencies is uh, wants to throw out everything. I just it just overstates the case to me. I think there are a lot of folks uh, who uh, attack the consumer welfare standard as applied or at least as interpreted by um, 
by some commentators, by some courts, as as um, as just way too narrow, way too price focused, and that it's possible with a more expansive view of what it is, uh, you could actually get a whole lot done. I mean, but right now it's sort of a a Rorschach test. You know, it's the ink blot that people see, and and only they and their therapist can can work it through. So I, I think uh, there is the ability to make sure that um, competition enforcement uh, takes into account quality innovation, uh, moves in the direction of uh, heightened scrutiny of what I call, you know, dominant firm Pac-Man behavior, you know, where you gobble up everything that's out there that could be a threat, you know, uh, which, uh, which it's questionable whether current law reaches that. There's a lot one can do to update antitrust enforcement. Uh, there is, uh, and you may need legislation to do it, given where we've gone over the last 40 years, but that, that sense that if we're going to make any error at all with regard to enforcement, it ought to be under enforcement. Uh, outside, particularly outside the, you know, uh, horizontal acquisitions in, in concentrated markets. Uh, you know, I, I think I think that absolute compulsion to avoid type one errors results in uh, a whole lot of under enforcement. And I think it is possible, and I think we will probably see uh, movement in the direction of trying to get that needle back to some sort of center point. It's never going to be at dead center, but uh, but I think there's opportunity to do that. So. My, my bottom line is, I think, um, you know, without embracing, uh, uh, you know, in all respects, the more aggressive views of some people on the progressive left, there are things to be done. There's, there's, um, there's money left on the table that, uh, uh, that changes to enforcement, and we'll talk about this later, I assume, possibly legislative changes can actually make antitrust enforcement competition enforcement, uh, more effective, more consumer oriented than it is today. Thanks, Bill. Maureen? Yeah, so um, I think one of the one of the issues here, one of the challenges is, um, so Bill Kovacic did mention this uh, sort of group campaign, whatever you, you might call it, that really focused on a handful of tech companies. And we're very successful, I think, in bringing this area of focus because they, you know, they picked on a, a few companies that also the press didn't love, right? So a lot of, <laughs> when you realize the fact that, you know, the reporters who were reporting on this, you know, the whole business model for, for the um, traditional media has been uh, sort of challenged by some of these companies and the advertising dollars or you know, where they're flowing. So that really amplified some of these voices. And so when you look at the House proceeding, they had these four companies. And by the way, that is not a House report, that is a House staff report. And that <laughs> is a little bit of a difference too, that it, did, it was not fully embraced by all the members on that committee, right? It was through the staff views. So now when you see, for example, this going over, you know, to the Senate and you have Senator Klobuchar's bill, that's not limited to those four companies, right? So that is much, much broader. So the so I think, you know, while you've had this kind of like very focused, you know, beam on like, oh, these companies and, you know, we don't like this. The idea that now we're going to broaden that out to, to make, um, you know, so many other companies subject to this. I, I think that it's going to be more of a challenge to get something like that actually enacted, right? Because now, you know, I think there are a lot of companies who are an interest who are happy to sit back and say, well, let's have those four companies take their knocks, right? They're big and they've been successful and they can do it. But now when we start saying, oh, you mean, wait a minute, if I have a 50% market share in some small market, uh, I'm going to be on the, I'm a small, you know, <laughs> I'm a regional player, but maybe I have a 50% share, you know, in a state or something like that. 
so I think that the, the politics are going to change in, in that. Um, and so now what the agencies do about it, right? I think that, you know, that, that, is, that, is, a, that is a challenge. You know, if they want to bring some more test cases um, or they want to advocate for, you know, different, you know, with some of the bills obviously have presumption, you know, flipping of, you know, burdens of proof and things like that. Um, you know, they may, that may be the direction that, that, that they go in. But I wouldn't presume that this intensity from a very focused group will actually carry the day in what Congress, if Congress acts, um, what might get passed. That's a great point. Maureen, and it, 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 I mean, another funny place the agencies have been, this is in the weeds and we'll talk about mergers later, but we've seen this trend, dig out the guidelines from 68 to 82 to 92 to 97 to 2010. The story has been, hey, we've got, the, we listen to those economists in BE and in academia, and we've got these tools to do narrower markets for unilateral effects and differentiated products markets. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry that the markets are getting narrower and narrower because we're relying on shares less and less. Um, we don't use shares to infer competitive effects because economics doesn't do that anymore. Uh, and we're doing the modern economics. Don't worry about the shares. Also, look at those shares is the new invitation. And I think in whatever ways the agencies handle that, it's a, it's a, it's a tension they're going to have to address whether in the guidelines uh, or if they want to sing a different song about shares, um, good luck to the litigators going to court and pointing to the agency to the agency guidelines. It's gonna—I mean—they're gonna have to address it one way or another. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm <laughs> doing more than a moderator should do, but you guys <laughs> knew I was gonna do that, right? Um, Bill Kovacic. Yeah, Josh. I—I I guess one thing that I would like to see the debate turn to is to examine some of the positive foundations for the normative arguments that have been made. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill talked about consumer welfare. I mean, part of, the, part of the problem we have is that so many of the concepts have, have been robbed of their meaning. Uh, they are loaded with so much baggage. There are so many ghosts in the background that you can't invoke them uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, and I think there's an epidemic failure in our field to recall just what actually took place. Uh, innovation effects are one. Um, I've heard so many observers say that the only focus of antitrust policy since the late 70s has been price or alternatively output. And I hear it so often that I start to go back and look at things I worked on over that period of time, just to remind myself that innovation and dynamic considerations were so much part of the picture. Now there's a reason for the creation of straw men that you can crush in argument. That is, if I want to move the direction of policy decisively, a, a technique, and Bob Bork in Antitrust Paradox was one of the main practitioners of this, I have to annihilate the status quo. I cannot leave any suggestion that the status quo had sensible people doing their best to come up with good solutions. I have to depict everything that happened as a calamity and more. I have to show that the people were almost irrational or malevolent. And when you do that, you wring out of the system any appreciation for what happened. There are a staggering number of matters since 1980 that focused on innovation as a core concern, complaint by complaint, opinion by opinion. Uh, could you have changed the mix some? But to behave as though innovation didn't matter. Uh, I can recall uh, uh, early time overlapping with Maureen at the FTC. Maureen was working for Commissioner Swindle. We had a vertical merger case. Did I say vertical merger? I did. Vertical merger case called SciTech Jigene, which looked at competition effects in the R&D pipeline for these pharma companies going all the way back to the earliest stages of R&D and patenting. And it prohibited the transaction. What was the concern? 
innovation for cervical cancer treatments. It was all innovation. It was a vertical merger case and it was blocked. Now, if you look at this whole period as being a wasteland and you say nothing happened and there was a myopic focus on price, why even study this case? Because it didn't happen. And again and again in these narratives, there is the sense that I can't make the case for change unless I annihilate the status quo. I think we have to bring the debate back more to a fuller discussion of what actually took place and how the agencies over time did a number of, I think, remarkably innovative and constructive things to deal with these. Now, you can sit back and say as a normative matter, it wasn't enough, it wasn't good enough, but we're not even at the point of having a common understanding of what happened and using that as the foundation for looking ahead. Uh, that is a desperately unattractive state of affairs to be in. Um, you know, uh, uh, another, another theme, just to finish with one other bad guy, that is who are, the, who are the bad guys from a variety of advocates for more activity, but, 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 the, but the arch demon is Bork himself. Uh, with his group of Satanists at the Chicago School. Uh, and how often do we hear that everything that happened in the past 40 years was Bob Bork, Chicago School, that we're trapped in that. When I was a young person, and I think Bill was a young person then too, there was this disappearing person named Phil Arita, uh, teaching at Harvard Law School with Don Turner and another young academic at Harvard called Stephen Breyer, who came up with an entirely different perspective on why competition law should be distrustful of non-economic objectives. And their main concern was that the more you open the door to the broader collection of policy concerns, the more you invite political intervention to tell you how to do trade-offs and make those decisions. And that's why Arita so clearly in his antitrust treatise in 1978 said, what do you do about the egalitarian vision? He said, you ignore it because you can't apply it effectively. Along with a number of other policy prescriptions, many of us in that period were shaped by Arita, Arita and Turner. Uh, they were the people who set the center of gravity for so many thinkers in this area. And it is the policy prescription that they offered and their challenge was just to say, as you expand the focus, and it's not to say you can't, but explain how are you gonna put it in place? If you have a long set of objectives, how are you gonna do it? Are you gonna be transparent enough to say what the trade-offs were and how you made them? Uh, that's the challenge. And I would hate to go for, before the Supreme Court now and look at someone like Steve Breyer and say, you're just a Chicago school dupe, probably along with Kagan here, who was your, who was, went to, taught at the same place. You're all suckers for the Chicago school. I can imagine Justice Breyer leaning back in the chair and saying, yes, go ahead, go ahead, finish up, but thinking this person is an idiot because they don't understand where so many of the ideas came from. And unless I think you know that positive foundation, I think it's hard to come up with normative prescriptions that are gonna be effective. Uh, now, is that partly an apology for my own life in this? I suppose so. I, I, I would prefer for it not to be seen as a wasteland, even though it's been professionally and personally satisfying. Uh, but uh, but I, am, I am astonished at how often in this annihilation apocalypse narrative, how much useful foundations for doing more in the future that just disappear. Thanks, Bill. Um, let me zoom into a specific question, and I think we'll do the, the, the international bit af after that. I want to talk, and I think this question combines a little bit of uh, the capacity uh, issues we were discussing along with, with, with mergers. So one of the particular proposals, and I've seen it now in any number of places, you know, legislative bills, various reports as a uh, burden shifting, lots of burden shifting. Um, you know, it's often presented as a, a, a don't, 
don't look at this either. It's just burden shifting, right? You can, you can come put on your efficiencies defense. It's not a big deal. Um, how many times have defendants come back from plaintiffs satisfying the prima facie burden in a section seven merger case once, once with an efficiencies defense? Um, in any event, burden shifting, we all, all know is, you know, plaintiffs dispels its prima facie burden in a section seven case is pretty big deal, but we've got proposals around to do this for some subset of transactions and they're different ones in the house and the Senate and academia and so forth. So we won't do all of the, the specifics, but there's sort of this uh, trend, I suppose. I, I think these burden shifting proposals in a way have been framed as the reasonable middle. We're not going to ban all of your mergers. Uh, the transformation list, I'm going to start using that bill, uh, have proposed bringing back the 1968 horizontal merger guidelines, 10% bright line rules, and so forth. Uh, it's not all the way there, uh, but it's not the sort of wicked status quo. We're just going to we're just going to shift the burden. And usually the rationale is uh, one of two things. Um, one is sort of resource based. The agencies just can't bring enough cases. And so we need uh, more resources. Yes, but a bright line rule will help us. Right. And I guess for most of these that are share based, you would still need to define a market and whatnot, and that can be expensive. But um, some of them are just dollar based. That's easier. You could just read, read the HSR form and be done. Um, but one of the justifications is resource based. Uh, and the other is something along the lines of that either the agencies can't win, it's too hard in the merger context, um, or they are winning but it's because they only bring the easy cases. My own experience is that the latter both sort of both aren't true. The plaintiff win rate over the last 30 years is 85% or so. Um, and so I think the, the backup position is, yeah, but those are all slam dunks. Now, you know, your mileage may vary on what a slam dunk is, but I think there are plenty of close call cases. Uh, there are cases that were litigated against a sense of one commissioner or two or three to two votes or that went and they lost and then they lost again on appeal. Um, lots of close calls, uh, lots of cases where the agencies stand up and they say, hey, we're going to challenge. And the parties run. Right. I think there were 16 of those in the last 18 months. Right. They don't have to litigate. That's hard for me to square the idea that the shadow of the law is so defendant friendly that when the defendants see it, they run the other way. Um, but this is sort of the, the, the proposals abound. And I think um, others obviously have a different view of the cases than I do, probably not of the win rate. Um, but I think these are the proposals that are getting the most attention. Uh, and maybe because they've been sort of framed as the, 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 the middle, uh, and maybe they are in the middle, um, I think are getting the most discussion and subject of hearings and, uh, and the like. You had the outgoing DOJ, uh, uh, making Delrahim on his way out, gave a proposal where he said something like, uh, something like this, right? So I wanna zoom in on mergers a bit. Um, and I guess the question, is a, a, you know, a broad one that you can run with in whatever direction you like, but it is how are the mergers laws working? Um, if they need change, do we think that this is, you can win under existing law? So you just need, a, you know, if they're budget constrained, so you shift the budget constraint. Is it that the agencies are gun shy? I don't. I don't remember the agency being gun shy when I was there. Um, th those, these cases, you know, Bill Baer, you mentioned leaving money on the table in these areas. I'm trying to get a sense of where the money's coming from that's left on the table. Is it, is it budget constrained money? Is it political will? Is it, um, what is it? How are the merger laws operating? Um, and what do we see as the top priority for the incoming administration in the, the, in the merger space? I will, for lack of creativity, go in the same order as before. Um, so, Bill Bear, you are always up first. I, I think you're just operating alphabetically, but uh, 
whatever. The um, look, I I think there are there's an area of uh, of merger activity that legitimately raises concerns that it's unclear whether it's reachable under current law and that the proposals, at least as I understand them, Senator Klobuchar's bill and others are designed to address that. Where you have a concentrated market, where you have a dominant firm, and they are able, uh, uh, whether it be a tech platform or a pharma company, to, uh, to take on folks who actually don't meet the actual potential competition standard right now. They're not in the market. They're not disciplining behavior in the market. Those transactions, uh, I think, are hard to reach under current judicial interpretation of Section 7 of the Clayton Act. And to the extent you think that phenomenon, that behavior by firms with a 50% market share, whatever threshold is, is worrisome, uh, I don't think um, and, and, and have significant effects on our economy. I don't think you can wait five to 10 to 15 years to try and develop some jurisprudence that, as I said earlier, moves the needle a little black back toward the middle. To the extent you believe that those acquisitions potentially raise significant problems, maybe you shift the burden. Um, and, and basically, uh, it, it will, Josh, you're absolutely right, uh, uh, affect some transactions. Folks won't go forward. Um, uh, but is that, at the end of the day, a bad thing? Is, um, uh, is forcing dominant firms to do more in-house innovation as opposed to buying up folks who potentially on their own or in combination with, uh, with another player on the market could provide meaningful competition to the dominant firm? You are clearly changing uh, the way the playing field is is level. And, and I think it may well be, in those cases, that's an appropriate course of action. Because given the state of, you know, antitrust jurisprudence today, those acquisitions, I think, are very difficult to challenge. And they, um, you know, with all due respect to Bill, uh, very rarely are. So I, I agree with you, Josh. When you look at the record, the agencies have had a very successful record of merger challenges and, you know, litigating them. And also when they uh, just say we're going to challenge a merger, the party's abandoning, right? That that's very that's very normal. So one of the areas where I was really getting concerned, and I think we have some really strong cross currents here, as you have the folks who want to. Um, say, oh, you know, state control, we should have more state control is where you had, you know, attempts to shelter mergers in the healthcare space from antitrust oversight by having state authorities kind of sprinkle a little like, oh, state oversight over it, right? And, and so, so, <laughs> so we have to, I think also pay close attention to what incentives are, are you are you creating there? I mean, uh, the, the 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 dynamics not going to change. You know, it's not going to say static, right? If you start saying, well, there's this presumption, and then it kind of raises the incentive to say, well, let's get the state, the local authorities, or whoever to say, well, no, this one is you know protected, and then we're going to be moving away from the idea that we should be as antitrust enforcers cast us cast us skeptical eye at state involvement and oversight of, you know, essentially private action. Uh, that, that, wor that worries me. Um, on, on Bill's point about, um, you know, large players being able to buy small ones. I mean, there's dynamics there we need to really pay close attention to. Like, will, will that have an impact on investment? in startups, in new technologies, in, you know, that kind, because th that is a whole ecosystem that we can't just change one part and think other changes won't happen. So, so may maybe that's my broader point, which is, I think the agencies have been pretty successful. If we make these other changes, things aren't just going to stay still and some of the effects 
or something we should pay close attention to because you, you may not end up in the place you want to be. Thanks, Maureen. Bill Kovacic? Yeah, I guess I guess as a initial comment, uh, sports analogies are so treacherous. I'm guilty of using them, but I would say there are no slam dunks in uh, in litigation and merger enforcement. Uh, I saw a commentator recently talking about the FTC's Facebook case saying this is a slam dunk, and I wondered what kind of basketball league are you playing in? Uh, uh, just uh, just uh, an, an astonishingly uh, uh, naive view of how hard any of this is to do in the courts today. Uh, it's, uh, there's nothing easy about it at all. And uh, I look at what Bill did in his time at the division, his latest incarnation uh, as a public enforcer, and the cases the department brought and won are really impressive. I, some may have been easier than others. I doubt any were uncontested layups, uh, much, le much less uh, slam dunks. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's helpful to look back at, at, at where the frontier of challenge has moved over time. Uh, if we go back into, uh, again, I think back in my early days at the FTC in the 1970s, the government there was basically attacking nine to eight or eight to seven in the horizontal world and bringing the occasional vertical merger case. Uh, even up through the 80s, uh, the famous Hospital Corp of American case, that's 11 to seven. The Warner Communications music case that the FTC brought and challenged, one in the Court of Appeals, uh, was six to five in the mid 80s. Uh, I don't know if the if the agencies could win HCA today, uh, given the view of coordinated effects. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you could win Warner Communications. I don't know if you could win any of a number of cases that the agencies brought even in the 80s and won at six to five or higher. Um, and you come to the present, you know, where have the government's victories been? in horizontal merger cases, whether with coordinated effects or with unilateral effects cases. Uh, I'm going to roughly say that the government has not prevailed in anything uh, um, more ambitious than four to three. Uh, most of the victories have been three to two or even two to one. Uh, so, so the perimeter that the government's been fighting at uh, for a considerable period of time is you get a second request, maybe it's six to five, five to four, you're in court at four to three, three to two, case like H and R Block. That's where you're. That's where you're battling it out. And I guess one view I have is, wow, if you're not able to win a significant percentage of your cases at that frontier, there's not much less left if the fence falls down and everyone pours in after that. Uh, an interesting question is, if you do have a genuine story of competitive harm, uh, you know at six to five, or even at something, uh, you know, hospital corp, again, 11 to seven, is that completely out of the question now? And, and I'm, I, it, it bothers me that the frontier is, 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 so, is so restrained. Uh, I think that's where you're taking more, more chances now. That concerns me. Do I have a specific legislative fix for that? I don't. But when you look at the rings and look at how those are compressed over time to the, the perimeter that the agencies have been defending, uh, that's shrunk so dramatically, uh, where where it's a, where it's where it's there are no giveaways trying to win at that level. I guess another issue that I'm 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 fascinated to see with the FTC 6B report on the on the tech merger shows. I'm really interested to see what that what light that sheds on what's taken place, because to me it points uh, it points to the question we've been talking about. Marine raised the question of incentives. I'm intrigued at how much you lose if in fact you slam the door on some of these deals. That is how much dynamism are you gonna lose? And, and a question that I would pose for my acquaintances in private practice um, who, who represent companies is you know, that a, a, a dart they often throw in my direction on something like Google double click, which is worth looking back at to say, what were, what were we thinking? Why did we do it? Uh, you should have done it. I said. Tell me how many deals you have come in to pitch over your career that turned out the way you thought they would, when they went through. How many generated the benefits that you had in mind or others that you weren't even thinking about? Give me your top five that really worked. And I think an interesting question, especially with the frontier being at it where it is now, 
is is how many of these are really good and if you and if you push the frontier out a bit how much are you losing because you do it i don't have the answer but uh i have i have i have been looking at transactions that we've looked at at the commission i have my i have i have doubts about how many benefits came from a lot of the deals that were at six to five, seven to six in that domain that we didn't take on or more highly concentrated when it, that went ahead. Again, my question to my friends in the, in the, in the bar and the economic consultancies is how often did the expected benefits come to pass? Let me move to a sort of cognizant of the time. We got about 15 minutes to go. So maybe I'll ask one and then, um, well, we'll 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 see where 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 we are, but I'm going to try to combine. Um, speaking of speculative efficiency, is going to try to combine a couple questions here. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the international antitrust community, and the you know we have we're having this sort of domestic discussion over what antitrust is going to look like here, um, but we're not having it in. Uh, a vacuum. We're having it in the middle of a, you know, a global antitrust discussion with lots of places doing lots of things and all of them pay, paying attention. I spend a lot of time going to talk to foreign enforcers and judges and uh, like, like Bill Kovacic said, believe, believe you me, they're, pay, they're paying attention uh, to what we do and say about the consumer welfare standard and um, just about everything else. So along those lines, we've also had a proposal to create uh, a new position in the White House uh, to, I've seen it described in one of two ways. And one is sort of a domestic quarterback of competition concerns among um, various agencies uh, that touch on competition issues uh, and also seen it described, and the two are not mutually exclusive, obviously, as a way to encourage the United States government having one voice on competition matters when it comes to international affairs. Um, and we've seen examples of divergence among at least the FTC and DOJ on these issues as of late and the SEP stuff, but also in, in, in other areas. Um, so let me toss around um, the question to solicit your views on the challenges facing the incoming administration in the international antitrust community. And if you'd like to take a stab at uh, how you see the possible cost and benefits of the creation of that sort of, uh, I refuse to call it a czar position, no matter what people in the press call it, I just won't. Um, that position, coordinator uh, position, uh, playing into the, the those concerns. So, um, Bill Bear. Well, first of all, the uh, that coordination about how to approach uh, uh, international competition, trade policy. Uh, in my experience, four years in the latter part of the Obama administration, that was done. Uh, uh, the NEC, uh, uh, Jeff Zients, before that, Jason Furman. Uh, they, we had those policy discussions. You know, I spent hours in the Situation Room talking about how, what our agenda would be with regard to Europe, uh, uh, with regard to TPP, with regard to China, on, on, you know, what should we be asking of them? How does it affect uh, 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 trade goals, competition policy goals? So I think that actually has, at least in the administration, I was actually involved in very much a part of the process. The uh, I think the the recommendations, and I was part of that equitable growth report that recommended that they elevate uh, or, or find a person or people with a domestic mandate uh, has been a little bit misunder misunderstood. You know, it's not to coordinate what the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division do what cases they bring or who bring them. It really is to make sure that in terms of uh, regulatory policy throughout the administration, that competition principles, worker rights, 
uh, uh, you know, the unintended or perhaps intended uh, effects of, of various behaviors are taken into account so that there is sort of a, um, a, a whole of government approach to the regulatory state. And it would, the notion, as I understand it, was to make sure uh, that, uh, that that was done. Now, looking at sort of the, the international competition approach, bilateral and multilateral, one of the things that uh, I think drives the, the differences uh, that we're, we're seeing is that other authorities, CMA, European Commission, do combine a little more of a prospective uh, and, and, uh, and responsibility and responsibility that goes beyond simply antitrust enforcement. So you, could, you can see uh, uh, Executive Vice President Vestager uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, privacy rights and perhaps uh, uh, coming up with some prospective rules that deal with artificial intelligence big data, and we haven't really thought uh, very much about whether or not we ought to be um, uh, combining functions in a way that allow for some prospective channeling of competition. I made the point in my last little thing, and then I'll turn it over to the other two, that um, uh, we, we, you know, we, we have by our case by case uh, approach to antitrust enforcement. The law can and does move, but slowly. I mean, the Google case isn't going to go to trial on, at the earliest until what? Tw September 2023, almost three years after it was brought, and who knows whether that's going to be delayed. To the extent we have concerns about any competitive outcomes in the U.S. economy, it's not clear to me that uh, uh, in these high-tech markets in particular, hospital markets, another example, pharma, that uh, going at this incrementally case by case is the only way to do it. And I, I think we ought to think about those areas where the externalities of competition or other public policy concerns uh, would, would cause us to uh, uh, want to intervene in a different way than simply by bringing a lot of individual cases. Thanks, Bill. Maureen. Yeah, so, um, look, I don't, I don't know what that position may end up being. I can only say what I would wish it would be, <laughs> which would be maybe taking on a, a little bit of the role of a competition advocate more broadly through the government, right? So the the thing we cannot use the antitrust laws to challenge is actual government action. Right, so we, um, but there that has a huge impact on competition, has a huge impact on market access. A lot of, I think the, the challenges that we're facing now um, that are kind of being laid at the feet of antitrust really could not just be solely antitrust, right? The difficulty in starting a business, um, you know, too many regulatory hurdles or not enough, you know, government, coordination or, or support. And I really hope that that would be something, you know, kind of going back to the Obama administration, they did a, a terrific report on occupational licensing. And, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not really concerned that at occasionally people take pot shots at occupational licensing reform. I think it's got, you know, enormous bipartisan appeal. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that we've seen in the pandemic that when some of these restrictions have been lifted on telemedicine, right? How important has that been? And remote learning and like, a, you know, a lot of those kind of things, I think that the benefits of having more openness in, in some of these things for the recipients of the services and for the providers of, of the services. And I'm never gonna you know, apologize for thinking that you know, African-American hair braiders shouldn't have to spend you know, 5,000 hours in licensing courses to do treatments that they would never do, right? So, so anyway, just to say you know, if we could have someone, because 
Um, I, as I, if I recall correctly, one of the things Australia did a, a few years ago to kind of generate growth in their economy was take a hard look at all the regulations that they had in place and say, are these doing, are these really in the public interest or can they be changed? And again, you know, not to be put into the idea that, well, if you, if you want to take a hard look at regulations, it means you think no regulation should ever <laughs> be in place, far from it, but more that uh, can they be, um, you know, harmonized in a way that allows for, if people are calling for more, a more competitive economy, I don't think we can look purely at private action to get there. I think we need to look at public, public as well. Um, as for Europe, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have engaged with Europe and we need to continue to, to engage with them on, on these issues. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are some, you know, worthy, uh, worthy work that's being done there. Uh, but I think globally, we also, you know, one of the things we typically had warned against is using antitrust for industrial policy purposes. And I think we need to continue to have a little bit of um, caution uh, about that kind of creeping, creeping into some of the critiques of the US system. It depends so much on what the mandate of the White House coordination uh, uh, program would be. Uh, uh, you know, at a high level, the idea of having a policymaker with an oversight of the broad span of public decision making that affects the competitive environment uh, makes a lot of sense. And to have that person uh, in the office of the White House uh, makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, that's a that's a a useful a useful contribution in my mind. Um, and and they're going to have a lot to work at. I mean, uh, a you know the 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 COVID experience has uh, has provided another external shock, along with the global financial crisis, that calls into question uh, the adequacy of regulatory oversight, the desirability of deep integration into global supply chains. Uh, the desirability of having greater domestic self-sufficiency, greater recourse and expansion of Buy America and other programs that are designed to build the domestic supply base. Um, uh, you know, when's the last time you heard a public official step forward and say, trade, that's a really good thing. That's a nice ingredient of larger policymaking. Uh, there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure to rethink the policymaking foundations for choices that we made going back to the early 1990s. And to have a policymaker in the White House who says, before you abandon all of these other frameworks or severely restrict them, here's what you might be giving up. Here's what it could cost you, I, I think would be very healthy. I think that that could be a useful function to have that, uh, to have that voice. Uh, I, just, I, I just say again that uh, there's a a, a, a relentless literature that says uh, in, in, so many, in so many ways that lots of the assumptions that guided that kind of advisory process in the past were ill-considered. And to have a voice of someone on the inside saying, not so fast, you don't have to throw it all away right away, I think would be, would be quite, quite helpful. Uh, uh, internationally, uh, uh, I think we're going to have to be running so fast to try and catch up with a debate that's well underway, policy making that is well underway, the, the, the DMA, DPA combination in Brussels is, that train's leaving the station already. In the UK, it's going to be the digital markets unit. In Australia, significant initiatives there. Uh, and if you look at related areas like privacy, does the US have a national privacy policy? Yes, it's called the GDPR in the state of California. That is our national privacy policy. And these other measures on, you know, Bill's alluding to, the development of uh, alternative regulatory tools, we are, we are so far behind in that debate and discussion. Again, it's, it's not funny. And, and those are proceeding in large part on the assumption that the U.S. has failed. Now, the U.S. in many ways is seeking to re-engage now, to be part of that discussion again. But... But there's a there's a strong possibility that uh, that the U.S. participation in some respects is way too late, and this is a big challenge for the new administration. What do you want to add to that debate? 
That is, what's your point of view going to be? Uh, are you going to be a moderating influence? Uh, do you like the DMA approach and everything that goes with it, with the pro list of prohibitions? Do you like something more like the United Kingdom framework? That's uh, the DMA, much more tailored to individual platforms. Uh, do you like the Australian approach to force platforms to pay for the news? That is, what do you like out of this constellation of policies and how are you going to engage, especially in an environment where, again, the consequence of having very, very effective advocates who say, if you're listening to the people who brought you policy over the past 40 years, you're listening to the wrong people. And there's a large attentive audience overseas that likes that message. It says, we thought so. And these are the people we don't trust. How do you regain their trust? And it's not just people are in policymaking positions. I think you've seen this as well, Josh. What are young academics or PhD students craving to write about in universities across the world? It is this new, envision, new vision of what competition policy ought to be. Uh, uh, and I think that is a, it's a major challenge for the administration to define its themes and to decide how to engage. Because in many respects, we're trying to catch up to that debate. Thanks, Bill. I, I, I promised I would let you guys out on time. Uh, and I've not done that. We're a minute over. Uh, so uh, I've done my best to sort of integrate questions that have come in from the audience uh, as we've gone. Um, I, will, I will say on my list of, of notes, um, the, the one that I did not get a chance to do is among the many excellent questions, uh, I, I will note for you, Maureen, there are several compliments on your brooch um, from the crowd. It is a hit. Um, uh, Bill and Bill and me, no compliments to speak of for any of us. Really hey, on. Ty, look at this. Come on. <laughs> really on. Ty, um, Ty, what is that? <laughs> Ty, it's, uh, it's when, uh, when, yeah, when the score is the same for both teams. That's oh, okay. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so let me let me wrap us uh, wrap us there uh, by uh, first thanking each of you for participating. I think this is a, a great way to kick off the symposium, and I'm really grateful to each of you uh, for participating. Um, that concludes day one of the 24th annual George Mason Antitrust Symposium uh, tomorrow at noon Eastern. Uh, we will have a session moderated by our own Tad Lipsky on tech platform cases. Um, and in the afternoon, uh, Judge Ginsburg will host a panel, uh, same time as this one, uh, four, same time, same place, same channel on antitrust litigation. Uh, I want to thank again our sponsors, uh, Freshfields and Charles River Associates uh, for their support of the program. And uh, last but not least, Tim Swartz, our student symposium editor, who is amazing and excellent and has worked like a dog to put this thing together uh, for the week. This is the Law Review Symposium. Um, we are happy to help out on the margins and offer a little bit of support, but um, if you see Tim, it won't be for a couple of weeks after he gets some sleep, but tell him he did a good job. And with that, uh, thank you panelists and thank you audience and we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Bye-bye.